Welcome to Smart Catalyst, December 17, 2018. So today we are going to see all these prelims article. The first one is Climate Talks Deliver Rulebook. The second one is Will GST Help in Doubling of the Farm Income? The third one is Navy to Herm the Center on Maritime Security. The fourth one is More Visitors from Home and Abroad. The fifth one is India Recorded 95 Tiger Deaths in 2018. And the sixth one is ISRO's GSAT 7A to add muzzle into Air Force. And the seventh one is the specter of deportation. And the last one is widening the Gulf. So the first article is Climate Talks Deliver Rulebook. So all the countries across the globe, the delegates from nearly 200 countries finalized a common rule book in order to abide by the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015 in order to reduce the temperature or the global temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius. So what the news here is, so the, all the nations on Sunday struck into a deal into landmark 2015 Paris Agreement or Paris Climate Treaty after the UN talks which was held at COP24 in Katowice, Poland, right? So that they come into a common rule book. Why a common rule book in the sense? Because without a clear rule book, we won't be able to see how the countries are tracking whether they are actually doing what they say what they are doing so in order to track all those things and countries behavior towards the effort of their climate change this common rule, rule book has been finalized okay so in the same common rule book they actually mentioned a mechanism to guard against the practices such as double counting emission savings by the developed countries so the developed countries actually have to contribute some amount of money to the developing countries in order to tackle the climate change by the developing countries. But as the developed countries are not having that much concern towards the developing countries as well as they are having lack of ambition to reduce the emissions, they actually made this kind of double counting emission savings and all. So it was clearly stated in the Oxfam report of 2018. So in all those reports, they actually mentioned about the double counting savings by the developed countries. So in order to achieve the Paris Agreement or Paris Climate Treaty only, this common rule book now has been finalized. So we have to know what this Paris Climate Deal means. So countries all across the globe actually adopted a historic international climate agreement at UNFCCC. COP21 at Paris in December 2015. So there only they outline what the post 2020 climate actions each and every country sh should intend to undertake. So that is what they mentioned as INDC which are in intended nationally determined contribution. If it, is, it was accepted at the Paris Agreement then it got converted into NDCs which are the nationally determined contribution and India is also having such NDC. So as per this NDC or as per this Paris climate deal, what the aim is to hold the increase in global temperature to well below 2 degree Celsius. Also some kind of efforts or extra efforts to limit to further 1.5 degree Celsius if possible as well as to reduce or to achieve the net zero emission in the second half of the century. Okay. So these are the aims which was put forward during the Paris climate deal. So now this COP24 actually uh, followed that and it welcomed the timely conclusion of the report and invited the parties to make use of it. And not only that, but the IPCC report which highlighted the need to reduce the carbon pollution by nearly half before 2030 in order to achieve this 1.5 degree Celsius. So in order to achieve this also we need this common rule book, right? So what does this IPCC means? IPCC is a leading international body for assessment of climate change. So they are just assessing the climate change. So it was established in the year 1988 by United Nations Environmental Program and World Meteorological Organization. They combinedly established it in and their headquarters is in Geneva, Switzerland. So what they usually IPCC do is they for every five to six years they actually come out with the comprehensive periodic reports on the climate change and during the uh, this recent COP24 they actually made use of that IPCC report as a base or guidelines okay so the next article is will GST help in doubling of the farmers income so this article talks about whether the GST implementation is beneficial or not for the agriculture sector or what are the positive and the negative impacts of the GST over the agricultural sector so first we have to know what is the nature of GST. It is a consumption based tax 
and it will be levied only when the food products are sold by the manufacturer to the cu customers or the consumers and it is not levied when they are actually in the manufacturing process because earlier they imposed excise duty which actually is a tax on products especially during the manufacturing but it is not like that it is only levied at the end when they are delivering it to the final consumer okay so why we actually have adopted this gst in the sense it is a gst is a tax reform which is undertaken by our government in order to increase the indirect tax base so G gst is an indirect tax base tax taxing system right so why they are doing it in the sense it in order to make a whole country as a unified common market thereby leading the nation's economy towards growth and sustainability so in this article they are talking about two major thing one is the fast moving consumer goods sector and another one is the agricultural sector so india's fast moving consumer goods sector has grown consistently over the past 3 years and it reaches nearly 25 billion dollar in retail sales alone so how it actually achieved it in the sense it might be due to the gst implementation as well as the opening of the foreign direct investment especially in food processing sectors which enable the growth of the food processing industry as well as it raised the market potential to grow nearly 12 to 13% in 2018 alone so it is the achievement by gst in terms of fmcg sector similarly if you see in agricultural sector which contribute nearly 16% of our gdp it is a major contributor right so there also this gst encourages the both the industry players as well as the stakeholders to create one of a kind national market for agricultural goods with a clear and hassle free supply chain so basically gst only promotes this agri sector by means of promoting this hassle free supply chain for example if you see the schemes like nam which is a national agricultural market it is actually in order to increase the transparency and impartial trade of agri commodities without any restriction of multiple taxation before we are having multiple taxation but now under gst it is a single taxation so it increases the transparency similarly if you see exemption on gst on storage and warehousing so government actually exempted the gst for the agri produce if suppose you want to store your agri produce in a warehouse then you can easily store there without any gst payment and all so exemption is there so it is also to reduce the tax burden on the farming sector as well as it created an opportunity for the farmers to sell their produce at best available prices in the indian market so by means of doing all these what the government actually aim is to realize the government's vision of doubling the farmers income by 2022 and also to rewrite the scope of profitability for the farmers so we have seen all the positive things because of gst right but now we are going to see what are some negative or implicit impacts of gst over the farming sectors or the agricultural sectors so government actually exempted the agri produce in warehousing from gst right so there is no gst for agri produce if suppose you are storing it in the warehouse but on the other hand it actually levy the taxes on warehousing companies as well as it levy taxes on agri products so one hand it is doing this but on the other hand it is also doing this so this is going to pose a challenge for and it defeat the very purpose of exemption itself that means application of gst to agri commodities impact not the rich people or not the middle class people it is obviously going to affect the people who are living under the subsistence level for example foods like grains and cereals meat fish poultry milk and dairy products so these all items are now coming under the ambit of gst so it is a burden on the food sector similarly if you see the large corporate companies which are majorly in agri processing sectors they are now adopting to the new regime of gst but the low income people or subsistent or grassroots people they are not accommodating themselves to the gst and they are still adversely affected or adversely impacted by the gst so what is the solution here means the food inflation is already pegged at 6% and the food wastage is pegged at 30000 crore so taking all these things into consideration it is necessary for industries and as well as a government to stress upon the importance of reduced taxation for processed food especially 
and especially the food consumed by the common people so these all should be coming under the ambit of reduced taxation or it should it should be exempted from the gst tax structure itself so the next article is navy to helm the center on maritime security so the news here is the navy that is the indian navy will formally inaugurate information fusion center for the indian ocean region later this week so what is the purpose of this information fusion center in the sense to provide the information on commercial shipping or the white shipping which is also known as white shipping so these kind of information about the commercial shipping or exchanged with the all the countries in the indian ocean region thereby we can improve the maritime domain awareness in the indian ocean and we can strengthen the maritime security in the region and beyond so these are the main aim for the sharing of the information about the commercial shipping across the countries so thereby it acts as a maritime information hub so this ifc is acting as a maritime information hub in the indian ocean region so before and all the information about the shipping which is crossing the indian ocean regions are actually transmitted by means of virtual means or telephone calls or faxes or emails or video conferencing so these are previous methods but now they are making use of this automatic identification system so this automatic identification system it is fitted on the merchant's ship thereby they can easily track them because the name the mmsi number position so these all indicate the usage of technology for sharing of information across the countries about the commercial shipping so why this kind of multilateral agreement over the information fusion center in the sense because there are already a lot of traffic in the indian ocean region especially because of this commercial shipping and it cannot be entirely monitored by any one nation so only this kind of multi multilateral agreement for the information fusion center has been recently been implemented okay so it this ifc was established at Navy, navy's information management analysis center in gurugram and it has like 21 ifc partners so the next article is more visitors from home and abroad so this is a statistics regarding the number of foreign tourists as well as the domestic tourists all across the country by the ministry of tourism and it actually has shown a steady upward trend over the years in 2017 so when compared to all the recent years in 2017 there is a heavy upward trend especially the foreign tourists there are more foreign tourists towards our country so generally this tourism or traveling here represent the movement of the people out of their place of residence except for the purpose of employment so this is what generally tourists means right so as per this the domestic tourists visited tamil nadu the most in 2017 so it attracts more domestic tourists but maharashtra att attracts more foreign travelers so these are the top 5 states which attracted the domestic tourists so these are the top 5 states which attracted the domestic tourists and these are the top 5 states which attracted the foreign tourists so uh, also the statistics represented like andhra pradesh and kerala topped with a high share of gross state domestic product coming from especially tourism so they are the high income states in terms of tourism and in smaller states and union territories andaman and nicobar is the higher income union territory in terms of tourism so the next article is india recorded 95 tiger deaths in 2018 so the news here is the nta which is the national tiger conservation authority it maintain an official database of tiger mortality and as per the database nearly 95 cases of tiger deaths have occurred in the country in 2018 alone and out of that 41 cases of deaths occurred outside tiger reserves and in that 14 occurred in maharashtra alone so if you see here the maharashtra is a home to nearly 190 tigers and in that nearly 75 of them are living outside the tiger reserve why because of the fragmentation of their living space or human dominated landscapes and there is a man animal conflict thereby so it only majorly contribute to the tiger deaths and if you see maharashtra madhya pradesh and karnataka they comprise nearly 60% of the tiger deaths so these are all captured by the official database by the national tiger conservation authority so in this perspective we have to know about this ntca it is a statutory body which is under union ministry of environment forest and climate change and it was provided this statutory status under wildlife protection 
Act of 1973. So the next article is ISRO's GSAT 7A to add muzzle to Air Force. So what the news here is, the GSAT 7A, which is an advanced military communication satellite, was launched on December 19 from Sriharikota. This GSAT 7A will be the first one which is built primarily for Indian Air Force in order to unify its asserts as well as improve its combined and common intelligence during the Air Force operations. Similarly, we are having this GSAT-7, which is primarily for the purpose of Army. So, it is for the purpose of Air Force. Okay. So, in future, they actually plan to launch this GSAT-7C, which is also for Air Force. Okay. So, about 70% of it would be the Air Force and rest is for the purpose of Army. So, they just split it like this. So, this GSAT-7 will enable superior real-time aircraft-to-aircraft -aircraft communication as well as it also enhances many times the coverage which is now provided by the ground communication system such as radars and stations of the army etc. So, it is very advanced. So, it was launched with the help of GSLV F-11. So, it is ISRO's fourth generation launch vehicle with three stages. So, those three stages are the first stage is four liquid straps and a solid liquid rocket motor at the core and the second one is high thrust engine using liquid fuel and the last stage is the cryogenic stage. So, these are the three stages of GSLV F11. So, the next article is the spectre of deportation. So, the National Register of Citizen, which is NRC, it contains the names of Indian citizens of Assam. We all knew about this NRC. So, it is majorly or primarily for the purpose of identifying the Indian citizens of Assam. Thereby, we can identify and deport the illegal Bangladeshi migrants from Assam into Bangladesh again. So, in order to do that, the NRC was first prepared in 1951 by means of using the census 1951 and it is updated periodically. But however, due to the various tensions, Assam is not doing the updation of the NRC since 1951. So, the NRC is being updated as per the provisions of Citizenship Act of 1955 and Citizenship Rules of 2003. If you see the background, in late 1970s, a massive drive by the All Assam Students Union, popularly known as Assam Education, against the illegal Bangladeshi migrants. They actually aim to deport the illegal Bangladeshi migrants from Assam. And in order to satisfy them, the Assam Accord of 1985 was signed, but the provisions of the accord was not implemented properly. And again in 2005, a new agreement was signed to update the NRC list on the basis of NRC electoral role up to the year 1971. So, whoever the people who are here before the year 1971, they can be uh, contained here, but other people after 1971 who entered into the Assam should be deported back. So, this is what again signed. And again in 2013, Supreme Court ordered to update the NRC within December 2017. So, now what the actual content here is, what are the problems in the deportation? So, now we identified the illegal Bangladeshi migrants and now they are going to deport them back to Bangladesh. But what are the problems here? So, there are legal as well as illegal Indian immigrants in Bangladesh. More than 5 lakh Indians were working in Bangladesh. So, obviously, this kind of deportation of illegal immigrants or legal immigrants from India to Bangladesh is going to affect the ties between India and Bangladesh. Because Bangladesh was reported to be among the most or highest source of remittances to India after US and Saudi Arabia. So, obviously, it is going to affect that. The most of the Indians are employed in advantageous jobs in Bangladesh, but the Bangladeshis are here appointed or employed only in the low paying jobs. So, all these things are now going to get impacted by means of this deportation. Even if India initiates the deportation, Bangladesh is also not ready to take the illegal immigrants back into their country because they already have a lot of overburden with the Rohingya refugees. So, this NRC issue as well as the deportation threaten to uh, disturb the equilibrium which is already existing between India and Bangladeshi ties and it will cause unrest among the two countries. So, these are all mentioned as the problems if at all we deport the illegal immigrants back to Bangladesh. So, it is what mentioned here. Okay. So, the last article is widening gulf. So, we all knew that the Qatar have withdrawn from OPEC which is the organization for petroleum exporting countries the last month and now it also decided to stay away from the December 9 
Gulf Cooperation Council summit in Riyadh. So this, these incidents actually indicate the growing disunity among the Gulf countries. So if you see the Gulf countries, these are the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE and Oman. So it is a regional political organization which have or which comprises of energy rich Gulf monarchies. And if you see the background, the Qatar is actually blockaded by three GCC countries. They are Saudi Arabia, UAE and Bahrain. By stating like Qatar is actually funding terrorism, this actually severs the ties between the Gulf countries in the previous phase. As a follow-up only, actually the Qatar announced its decision to quit the OPEC. Okay, So it is the first Arab nation to do so. And during the blockade by the Saudi Arabia towards Qatar, it is actually gets upset because the Oman and the Kuwait didn't join this embargo. And the Oman and Kuwait actually supported the Qatar and Iran on the other hand. So it actually boosts the Qatar's independence. So it shows clearly the Qatar is only more independent Gulf country in that region and especially in terms of its foreign policy decisions. So the decision to quit the OPEC as well as the absence of its head at the GCC point to an increasingly confident Qatar in or among the Gulf nations. So this intra-Gulf quarrels have actually worsened the hopes from the integration of the region despite of the presence of the Gulf Cooperation Council or any kind of these kind of multilateral organizations.